Good day, Deep and Word family. Welcome to day 334 of our Bible study review. Today we're opening up a new book, which is actually a letter to the body of Messiah in Corinth, better known as 1 Corinthians. Now today we're going through the chapters 1 through 4. Now the assembly, the body of Messiah in Corinth, we're going to see early on that they're not like the Thessalonians. The Thessalonians were the standard. Paul was bragging on them. Now the body of Messiah in Corinth, honey, they're on the struggle bus for real. And so he's having to correct some of them and their conduct, the way that they walk, the way that they love one another, and the way that they believe, who they say that they follow. Let's get into this letter from the first chapter and see the rebuke that comes from Paul, the elder. So he says right here, Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, through the will of Elohim and Sosthenes, our brother, to the assembly of Elohim, which is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Jesus Christ, called to be saints with all in every place who call on the name of Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord, both theirs and ours. He says, grace to you and peace from Elohim, our Father and Lord, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. He says, I thank my Elohim always on your behalf for the grace of Elohim, which has been given to you through Yeshua HaMashiach. By him, you are enriched in everything, in all speech and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Yeshua was confirmed in you, so that you are not lacking in any gift while waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. If you have a highlighter or a pencil, please highlight verse five because he wants to let the Corinthians know who enriched them. And he says, by Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach alone, in him you are enriched. He's going to touch on this a little bit later. Verse eight, he says, he will strengthen you to the end so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord, Yeshua HaMashiach. Elohim is faithful. And by him, you were called to the fellowship of his son, Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord. Now, I ask you, brothers, by the name of of our Lord Yeshua HaMashiach, that you all speak in agreement and that there be no divisions among you, but be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brothers, by those of you who are in the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this is what I mean. Every one of you is saying, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Peter or Cephas, or I am of Christ. He says, is Christ divided? Is Messiah divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Paul is addressing them and their division on who they follow or who they claim. He goes, you have everything in Christ. I came to you and I preached Christ crucified. I did not preach to you myself. I did not preach to you anyone else. No one else is taking credit. No one else is giving you power from on high. None other than Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to say, I'm so glad that I only baptized a couple of you, lest the rest of you should say that I baptized you in my own name. Let's pick up in verse 17. Paul continues and he says, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with eloquent words, lest the cross of Messiah should be made of no effect. For those who are perishing, the preaching of the cross is foolishness. But to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of Elohim. He says, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. He says, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Or where is the debater of this age? Has Elohim not made the wisdom of this world foolish? For since in the wisdom of Elohim, the world through its wisdom did not know Elohim. It pleased Elohim through the foolishness of preaching to save those who believe. He says, look, the message is really clear and it's really simple. Christ crucified and in him you live and in him you have power. That's it. Not these eloquent words that make you look smart or make you look puffed up before the rest of the world. He says, no, it's very simple. We have power 
in Christ. He came, he laid his life down, and he died for us, and in him we live. That's the simple message. I didn't bring anything fancy unto you, and it's in him. But then he wants to tell you, right? There's different people groups. We know that the Jews require a sign. And then the Greeks, they were known for, you know, philosophy. They were known for exchanging these deep, you know, metaphorical things amongst each other. And he goes, no, nope, I didn't come to you with any of that. Verse 23, Paul says, nope, we keep it simple over here. He says, I preach Christ crucified. We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Greeks. But to those who were called both Jews and Greeks, we preach Christ as the power of Elohim and the wisdom of Elohim. For the foolishness of Elohim is wiser than men, and the weakness of Elohim is stronger than men. Well, there is no weakness in Elohim, but to men, it seems like a weakness to just say, is that it? Is that the message? That there was a man, he came, he died for your sins, and now you have the wisdom? Yes, the fear of Elohim is the beginning of wisdom. And he told you right here that preaching Christ is the power of Elohim and it's the wisdom of Elohim. He's telling you that the body of Messiah, who he is, the second Adam, he is the one. He is the embodiment of the front of the book. And knowing who he is and fearing who he is, that's the beginning of wisdom for you. Because he is the one who the Father sent as per Deuteronomy chapter 18, when Moses was telling the children of Israel, he is sending one from your brethren and he is the one, he's the major prophet that you must listen to. And if you don't, your life will be required of you. So yes, the message is this simple. So he's essentially saying the weakness of men is they want to overcomplicate things. They want the glory for themselves, right? And they don't get the glory. The one who laid down his life, he gets the glory. And men doesn't like that. That seems too simple. There has to be another way, right? He says, nope, there's no other way. Let's continue. Verse 26, for observe your calling, brothers, among you, not many wise men according to the flesh, not many mighty men, and not many noble men were called. But Elohim has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Elohim has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. He says, look at Slim Pickens around here. And he chose you. He chose you, the Corinthians. He says, look, there's not many noblemen, not many wise men, and not many mighty men among you. Yet he chose you to confound the world through this message, Christ crucified. And in him you live and you have power and authority and in him you overcome. And the world is going to be dumbfounded by these simpletons, right? Who are made over in the image of Christ. Paul goes in even further to let them know they're not the most eloquent people. He says, and Elohim has chosen the base things of the world and things which are despised. Yes, and he chose things which did not exist to bring to nothing things that do, so that no flesh should boast in his presence. But because of him, you are in Messiah Yeshua, whom Elohim has made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Let him boast in Yeshua, because it's in him that you have all things, and outside of him, you're nothing. Chapter two, let's start reading from verse one. He says, brothers, when I came to you, I did not come with superiority of speech or wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of Elohim. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He says, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit of power so that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of Elohim. And then Paul gets into the topic of revelation that comes by the spirit of Elohim. See, man likes to boast in their philosophical conversations, you know, but when you start talking about the things of heaven, the things of God, it sounds like foolishness to them. But for you, when you're talking to them and they're speaking these deep philosophical things, you're like, what is it that you gain the whole world and you lose your soul? This means nothing. You will not see eternity. You won't even see, right? The iceberg, the tip of the iceberg of the glory. This is a night 
mirror. But when our king comes back, it will be so, so glorious. It reminds me of the expression that for believers, true disciples and followers of Christ, this is the closest that we'll ever get to hell. But those outside of him, this is the closest that they'll ever get to heaven. So when people are, you know, exchanging words and we're trying to share with them the deeper things, right? The, the true things of Elohim, the glory that is coming, the things that eyes have not seen and ears have not heard, right? But they keep trying to tell you of what's in the here and now. And you're like, don't you see that this is perishing? This is garbage. Not the earth, but the world system because it's satanic. It's being ran by Satanists, literally. All right, but let's get back to the reading right here in verse six. Paul says, yet we speak wisdom among those who are mature, although not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of Elohim in a mystery, the hidden wisdom, which Elohim ordained before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age knew it, for had they have known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear has heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things which Elohim has prepared for those who love him. Those are the things that we try to reveal to people. And they think we're just in this dream land. But we know that they're really in a dream land. This is truly the matrix. Let's keep reading from verse 10. Paul says, but Elohim has revealed them to us by his spirit. See, that's the simplicity of the truth. He says, by his spirit, not by power, not by might, but by his spirit has he revealed these deeper things unto us. He says, for the spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of Elohim. Hint, hint. That's why I call this deep in word. All right. He says, for what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of man, which is in him. Likewise, no one knows the things of Elohim except the spirit of Elohim. Verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of Elohim, so that we might know the things which are freely given to us by Elohim. These things also we proclaim, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of Elohim, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Have you tried to reveal something to someone who has not been baptized with the Holy Spirit and they just don't see it? That's because they can't. They won't. They don't have the Spirit. They can't see the things in Spirit because they're not of the Spirit. Paul continues and he says, But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is not judged by anyone. For who has known the mind of the Lord, of the Adon, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Yes, when you read his word, it starts washing your mind of all the filth that has been placed in there before. And then wisdom starts to enter in as you practice and you start walking in obedience. You get more wise, right? And you start to understand the things which are written when you walk by the way of the spirit. And then when you start speaking these things to those who are Outside of Christ, you sound absolutely foolish to them. Look, I've had my fair share of this when I decided to burn it all and walk solely for Christ and I start talking about spiritual things, they think I have lost my mind. Jimmy cracked corn and I do not care because I'm not here to please man, right? I'm here to please Elohim. All man does, they will sit there and they will receive all of these other deep philosophical teachings, these teachings from other spiritual things, which they don't know are demons. They'll receive everything else except Christ because this is foolishness to them. So I'll be a fool for Christ. I don't care. I don't need the accolades. I don't need man's, you know, recognition. I just want that well done from my king. That's it. That's what I'm chasing. So everything else is foolishness to me. All right, let's continue reading in chapter three, starting from verse one. Paul continues with this letter. And unfortunately, this is not going well for the Corinthians. He says, brothers, I could not speak to you as to spiritual men. 
not a compliment. All right. He says, but as to worldly, even as to babes in Christ, he says, I have to speak to you, you know, like your little babies because you're acting like them. He says, I have fed you with milk and not with solid food for to this day, you were not able to endure it, nor are you able to now for you are still worldly. Since there is envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not worldly in behaving as mere men? For while one says, I am of Paul, and another says, I am of Apollos, are you not worldly? Sheesh. Verse 5. Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to each one? I have planted, Apollos watered, but Elohim gave the increase. So then neither is he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but Elohim who gives the increase. Now, he who plants and he who waters are one. He's saying they are echad. He's saying we're one on a mission. And he says, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with Elohim. Do you see that marriage language. He's saying we're working together with this mission in mind, co-heirs, co-mission. He says, you are Elohim's vineyard. You are Elohim's building, aka temple. He's essentially saying y'all cannot get it together if you don't even know who you are of. Please stop saying that you are of Paul or you are from Kepha or you are of Apollos. No, you are of Christ. You are of Christ. The second Adam, he is the one. It's his body that you are a part of. You're not part of my body. He's like, that's why I didn't baptize you because you ain't ready to receive the truth yet because you don't even know who you belong to yet. You think you belong to me? You think you belong to Apollos? You don't belong to them. You belong to Christ. Get it together. Child, he could barely give them the milk. They really ain't ready in Corinth. He says, according to the grace of Elohim, which has been given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, but another builds on it. Now let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no one can lay another foundation than that which was laid, which is Jesus Christ. He is the foundation for the house. We are the little pebbles being built up in his house. This is a message for us as well. We need to understand that the church is not a building. The church means assembly, ecclesia. It's his literal body. It's the Messiah's body. He's the head. We are his body. So we need not, we need not have any arguments about, oh, this is my ministry or this is this person's ministry. We're all co-heirs on a co-mission, building up the kingdom of Elohim here on earth, making the way, preparing the way for the king before he comes, building up disciples, teaching and edifying and loving one another. That's it. That's the mission. So if anybody breaks off and they said, this is my church or this is your church. No, there's only one church and that's the body of Messiah. That's the Holy Spirit, y'all. All right. So let's pick up in verse 12. It says, now, if anyone builds on this foundation, which is Jesus, which is Yeshua with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble, each one's work will be revealed for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. So there is a work to be done, y'all. A lot of people are scared of this word work, but we're called to be diligent workers for the kingdom. We're called to build upon the foundation, which is our Messiah. It's the house. It's precious souls, bringing souls into the kingdom. He says he's going to test everyone's work by fire when he gets here. He says, if anyone's work, which he has built on the foundation endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. Now, if your work is burned and it suffers loss, it's because you did it in the wrong heart posture. You did it for your own glory. You did it because you wanted people to know your name or you did it for notoriety. For whatever reason, you didn't do it for the kingdom. And that's why it'll be burned up. He says, but he himself will be saved, still going through the fire. So check your heart, check your heart posture, make sure that you're truly doing this and that you're bringing the glory back to where it belongs because it doesn't belong to you. It's for him. 
Paul goes even deeper. He says, do you not know that you are the temple of Elohim and that the spirit of Elohim dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of Elohim, Elohim will destroy him. Do you see what he's saying? If anyone destroys the house that he is building, if anyone goes to destroy a soul or to tear them away from the truth of the gospel, he says he will destroy you. He will destroy you for tearing down his house. He says, for the temple of Elohim is holy and you are his temple. So he says, if anyone comes to try to tear you down, um, he says, Elohim will destroy that person for tearing down the house of Elohim. If there's someone who's in the body of Messiah and then they entice you to go back into the worldly things, do you not understand that that's tearing down his house? Do you not understand that he says that there's some true fire coming for you if you do that? If you influence people back to worldly things, look, y'all, he's not playing. And the body of Messiah in Corinth, um, they're not off to a good start. They're catching that smoke from Paul right now. But better from Paul than from Messiah when he comes and he brings that real fire. All right. Let's keep reading verse 18. He says, let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. He's saying, if you think you're wise in the worldly matters, he says, let him become a fool. Become a fool for Christ so that you'll have the true wisdom. That's what he's saying. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with Elohim. For it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. Therefore, let no one boast in men for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours and you are Christ and Christ is Elohim. He's trying to show you this marriage, this being one with Christ so that you may be one with God, so that you may come into the family and experience the eternal joy. He says, all of it, all of it is in him. It's not in me. Paul says, it's not in me. It's not in Apollos. It's not in Cephas. It's not in anyone else. The foundation is Christ. And he says, essentially, if you're in him, you're going to inherit everything. Chapter four, verse one. Let a man so regard us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by man's judgment. Paul says, y'all could say whatever y'all want to say about me. I really don't care. Your, your judgment means nothing to me. He says, I do not even judge myself for I know nothing against myself. Yet I am not justified by this, but he who judges me is the Adon. He's saying Yeshua. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time until the Lord comes. He will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will reveal the purposes of hearts. Now, if you want to tie that back to the fact that he says each one's work will be revealed by fire. He will know the intent of your heart in which you did a thing. And if you did it for your own glory, you will not receive a reward for it at all. So Paul is essentially saying, look, whether you judge me or I judge you, it means nothing. Only the Messiah can pierce through and look through your heart and see the intentions of why you're doing a thing. And he he's going to map it all out with each and every last one of us. And if we did it in the right heart, well, then we receive our well done we receive our job titles and we inherit the kingdom. But if what you did, you did it for selfish purposes, everyone is going to know it. Everyone is going to know it because you won't have a reward. And so they'll know that all of the accolades, all of the things that you did, you did it for your own self glory. And he says, yeah, welcome in the kingdom, but uh, it's probably going to be least. This is a good time right now as we're reading this for you to check your heart posture, for you to check why you get up, why you do what you do. This is a good time to check your heart and say, what am I truly living for? Why do I do what I do? Do I do it for me or do I do it for him? It's time to get it together. Okay. He says, because when the Messiah comes, then everyone will have commendation from Elohim. Brothers, I have figuratively applied these things to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, so that you may learn from us not to think of men above that which is written, and that not one of you would be arrogant for one against another. He says this is foolishness. 
it's foolishness to have these, you know, contentions among one another saying that you're from this or you're from that. You're all in Christ. Get it together. He touched on arrogance right here. We have to be careful because when we learn something new, when he reveals something by his spirit, some people get puffed up in knowing these things and then they try to lord it over believers who don't know it yet. He says, be careful, be careful in the spirit in which you do things. He says, don't walk in arrogance. If you have learned something and the father revealed it to you, reveal it to the brethren in meekness of spirit. That's the tone in which he is speaking because he continues and he says, and what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you have received it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? If you receive revelation from him, it's a gift you received from him. It's not something that you earned yourself. No, he gave it to you as a gift. So why would you lord it over someone else? Give it to them as a gift as it was given unto you. Believe me, I've had to check myself a time or two when it comes to this subject, all right? So I'm preaching to myself as well. Let's pick up in verse 8. He says, now you are full. Now you are rich. Now you have begun reigning as kings without us. And I wish to Elohim you reigned so that we might also reign with you. For I think that Elohim has exhibited us, the apostles, last, as if we were sentenced to death. For we have been made a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honorable, but we are despised. Even to this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are poorly clothed and beaten and homeless. Paul is saying, do you understand? I'm truly suffering for this message. I'm suffering. I'm pouring myself out. I don't have on, you know, rich clothing. I have rags on. I'm starving as I'm writing this letter to you. But you, you have all of these worldly things, and yet you don't understand how rich you are in Christ. He says, we labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we endure, being slandered, we encourage. We are made as the filth of the world, and we are the refuse of all things to this day. I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you, for if you were to have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you have not many fathers. In Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, I have become a father to you through the gospel. Paul is saying, look, you're acting like children. You may have a thousand instructors, but no one is talking to you the way an elder should. No one is loving you and correcting you the way that a father should. Look at his speech and what he was talking about. Does not a father and a mother, do they not sacrifice for their children, right? If if it means that they skip a meal so that their children can eat, that's what a parent would do for his child. And so that's what Paul is saying. He goes, okay, you may have the best of the best and maybe you're starting to rule and reign. And he goes, here I am, I'm pouring out and I'm sacrificing so that you will have the best and you don't even understand what the best is. It's in Christ. Let's pick up in verse 16. He says, so I implore you, be followers of me. Therefore, I have sent Timothy to you. He is my beloved son and is a faithful one in the Adon and the Lord. He will remind you of my ways, which are in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every assembly. Now, some are arrogant as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you shortly if the Lord wills. And I will know not only what those who are arrogant are saying, but also their power. For the kingdom of Elohim is not in word, but in power. What do you desire? Shall I come to you with a rod or in love and in spirit of meekness? Do you see how that ended? Paul is talking like a father disciplining his children. He goes, do you want me to come to you like with this belt? <laughs> or do you want me to come to you with a hug? He's like, I need y'all to get some act right take two tablets of act right before I get there. So he sends Timothy, his spiritual son, who has been walking with him because they need a live example because they're not walking together, you know, in like manner. They're not walking together. They can't even agree on the basic thing of who they are in. They're in Christ. Many of them are saying, I'm of Paul or I'm of Kepha. And he's like, y'all don't have the foundation right. He goes, look, I'm not giving up on y'all. I'm sending my son. Y'all need some help. Y'all got to get it together if y'all are going to make it through these times. Sending Timothy is a mercy unto them because if Paul immediately came to them, 
He might have been flipping some tables, just like the Messiah did. He might have been doing some stuff, you know, to put the fear of Elohim in them, because sometimes children, they don't get the point until they get the rod. As you can see, the body of Messiah and Corinth, they're not off to a good start, and we're going to see more tomorrow. Stronger rebukes tomorrow. And that's because Paul loves them. Now, if he didn't care, he would have walked away and said, you know what? Let them do what they want to do. But that's not his heart. The heart of a father does not give up on his children. And that's how Paul sees everyone because he was the one who actually laid the foundation. Now, Christ laid the foundation, but he is the one who brought the gospel to them and started these assemblies in these various places all across the old world. And so this is a man who sees all of them as his children. And he's like, I'm not going to give up on you just yet. I'm going to send my spiritual son to give you a spiritual spanking, and then maybe you'll get it together. But that's all we have for today, Deep in Word family. I'll see you tomorrow for some other rebukes that he has for the body of Messiah, the children in Corinth. Until then, Yah bless.